Hello, everybody. Stu Smith here going live. Hope you are well and hanging in there this Monday morning. Easy day. Time to get started. So, um, article I'm working on today is about lifting. And what I mean by that is any type of resistance training can be done, accomplished at any age with life extending benefits for the person who is doing some form of resistance training. In fact, I've got a big list here of all the benefits, you know, to include longevity, adding not just years to your life, but life to your years, a little bit more sturdy. You know, it is harder to hurt yourself when your bones are stronger and your muscles are stronger. So it makes a fall less deadly as we age. Uh, but you just feel better. You know, you, you have stronger bones, better sleep. Stronger and firmer muscles, noticeable gains. Even when you're in your 70s and 80s, you can see muscle gains and growth. Fat loss, muscle firmness, you know, all of those activities, you know, come from just some form of resistance training. And I'll get into those in a second. Um, increased durability and balance. Those are very important as well, especially as we're aging. Um, mental health, definitely. Uh, look better, feel better, burn more calories than walking at the same amount of time, you know, spent lifting. Um, other improvements can be motor control, better cognitive abilities, enhanced cardiovascular health. Better bone development, reduction in chronic pain. So many reasons why resistance training is important. And this doesn't have to be like you have to join a, a gym and go be a, a muscle head. You know, calisthenics is probably your first phase of resistance training. And you can do one of two things. You can make calisthenics harder with dumbbells or weight vest, or you can make calisthenics easier with a trx or rings you know so whenever you're doing a squat you have part of your body weight being pulled in your hands and it's not all on your legs when you're first starting out you can do rows instead of pull-ups so there's so many ways to get on that spectrum of resistance training if you just get creative you know another way is if you do join a gym and you're new to lifting, start off with machine weights. You know, you can make those easier than calisthenics. You know, most people can't do a pull up, but they can do a pull down with a lat pull down machine, just as effective. And it will build you up towards doing heavier activities and maybe even your own body weight at some point. But then, of course, you know, the progression gets bigger and bigger, and you can start using barbells or kettlebells you know things that are starting to get heavier you know heavier than your body weight but you know the way i start people with lifting weights and usually it's a young teenager maybe a 12 or 13 year old kid is we start off with calisthenics we start adding some auxiliary exercises with dumbbells mix in some trx because Sometimes that age group can't do pull-ups yet, so we do a version of pull-ups with those. Um, work those muscle groups with rows and bicep curls and, you know, with dumbbells and things like that and the TRX. And then, you know, after a year or so of that, they get a little older. They get a little more, uh, they put on some muscle mass. You know, when you first get, in, get started, you will see a noticeable difference you know that's kind of like the beginner concept of uh of lifting you know all the beginners see great gains and then later on it's uh um it's just one of those things that um 
just harder to get games, but you still are killing it. So, you know, as long as you're being consistent with your um, with your training. So, yeah, that's it. Get up and burn some calories. Lift something. You know, it could also be just walking around the yard, pulling a wheelbarrow around, doing yard work. You know, that is a form of resistance training as well. Carrying mulch from one end of the yard to the other. It's a good one. <sighs> so, get lifting. Get living. Keep on lifting. Even if it's the basics. Your bones and muscles will thank you for that. Do I know who Pierre, Peter Atia is? Yeah. Isn't he like the longevity live forever guy? I'm trying to think um, who that is. Um, I know he wrote a book on it, right? Um, let me look him up here real quick. The Science and Art of Long... Oh, yeah, Outlive. Yeah. Actually had that on... Uh, um, uh, audiobook. Yeah, I knew it was familiar. Yep. I have the book. Um, good stuff. I notice I have slightly asymmetrical pull-up. Do you suggest scapular pull-ups? That's a good start. Or other exercises to fix it, maybe as a warm-up. Um, yeah, scapular pull-ups is a great way to start. Um, you know, mixing in some dumbbell work, seeing if you notice a difference in your in your rows and your uh, bicep curls, even your overhead press. You know, see if there is a difference in your movements there. You know, get a mirror or have somebody film you, and you can see if you're you're having issues with whether it's your shoulder blades need a little bit of work. You know, with some like reverse flies or, um, you know, maybe it's your, your lats or your biceps. You know, that are causing a slight uh, weakness. Could be a shoulder impingement causing it. I've seen that get tweaked a little. You know, there's a couple things that you can do um, with those muscle groups. And, you know, my suggestion would be start off with YouTube and see if you got a physical therapist out there that can show you to, you know, really work that, you know, the, the scapular area. Um, rhomboids could be your traps even your uh and then overall weakness in your lats but yeah start there start with the scap pull up and then mix in some upper back exercises reverse flies birds arm haulers you know those are good calisthenics versions and then add some weight to it like a five pound dumbbell and do the arm hauler reverse flies um that really is a good way to start building balance. That's kind of like all of my PT reset exercises you might be familiar with. Head into West Point at the end of June. Nice. Do you have any tips for it since you're a USNA grad? Well, um, it's going to be a little different than Naval Academy. Uh, both are difficult, but you will do more army-based training naturally um, you'll do the acft you'll be rucking uh plebe summer they don't ruck at all um they will run and pt that's about it they may do some obstacle courses and stuff like that um but they don't do a lot of load bearing other than some stuff with boats a little bit of log pt but you may see all of that there at West Point. I would think West Point's just a little bit more physically demanding just because you do have that ACFT at some point you have to take, um, which is legit. So if you're looking for something 
to prepare yourself for it, my suggestion is start here. It's the Army PFT workout, but it's been updated. It's just the cover has not been. It's the PFT and the CFT, as well as uh, workouts that build up your running and rucking to uh, to be able to handle the load of of what's coming. But I mean, you're only look. I will say this: this is like a ten week program, so. Um, you know, in three weeks, you're probably not going to be able to use that one. So my advice would be to, you know, start, start with a running program now, if you haven't, um, and start practicing that ACFT as long, along with, um, uh, rucking. So, so it's not foreign to you when you get there, you know, be honest with you. At the end of June, you got like three and a half weeks. You might be able to get in some army shape, but you got to be specific to your army. If you're doing stuff like football workouts and swimming workouts, they're not going to apply to what you're trying to get through. So try to get specific to you know what's coming. You know the ACFT is coming. You know rucking's coming. That would be my focus, but you're also going to be doing a lot of PT. So make sure you're doing push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, running, and the ACFT and rucking. All right. Uh, Bernardo says, I'm diagnosed with costochondritis. Any tips for dealing with that? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, that hurts. Like all the little cartilage inside your ribs gets inflamed and that's that is not fun. Uh it looks it feels like you're having a heart attack. Um from what I hear, um a lot of times that happens from getting uh what do you call it with the tick bites you. Ah <sighs> Lyme disease. When you get Lyme disease, that's one of the after effects of Lyme disease. So if you have an uncured Lyme disease issue, get a Lyme disease test. You might be able to get some meds and get the Lyme disease taken care of. I don't know. Uh, that may help with those costochondritis symptoms, but at, talk to a doctor first. Um, really, the only way I've ever heard anybody get through with the uh, costochondritis is just anti-inflammatories, you know, medication. If you can get some supplements that uh, help with that, like, you know, fish oil or vitamin E, um, you know, anything that helps with typical inflation symptoms, that, that may be helpful. Omega, omega threes, that's what I meant. Mega three instead of vitamin E. But yeah, Motrin. Motrin has been very helpful for the people I know who have costochondritis. I tell you what, though, the first time you get it, most people are going to the hospital because they think they're having a heart attack when it, it's actually all the cartilage in their, their ribs are hurting so much it feels like a heart attack. What does your diet look like building up to your test? Uh, what I'm not sure. What's your t what test are you talking about, Brian? I haven't had many tests in decades, and at least official ones. I mean, I take fitness tests all the time, and I just eat normal. I don't have a particular special diet for when I do hard workouts. You know, I eat today to recover from this morning's workout and I'll eat tonight to fuel up for tomorrow's workout. Um, you know, a little extra carbs usually is what I do. I was also looking for a 45 pound weight vest to buy. Do you have any suggestions possible with shipping out of us? Um, no, you might be able to find something on eBay. 
is what I would do. I found a pretty good one that's inexpensive. Um, what is it called? I think it's like Z. Z Max or something like that. Z Max weight vest. Let me see. Did a. I did a. A, a weight vest review article. And I put that in there. So going to the Google machine, weight vest review, Stu Smith. Um, here it is. So check out this article. I have three or four different articles on there or uh, weight vests on there that I like. You know, one from weightvest.com. That's an obvious one. There was another one I used uh, called the Raptor. They're out of England. Might be cheaper shipped there. Um, and then, um, I think it's Z force or Z max. I can't remember. In fact, let me look in here real quick. Cause I know I put it in this article. Oh, ZFO sports. That's what it is. In fact, I'm going to the ebay.com and typing in ZFO sports, ZFO sports. Weight vest. And where are you? Come on. There you go. You got some. Some are kind of crappy. Here's one. 40 bucks. Damn. $100 for shipping. That sucks. Um, you got to look at these shipping. 77 plus 15 for shipping. Every now and then you'll get uh, a real basic shipping because... Uh, It'll fit in a in a box that's normally like ten dollars shipping here in the United States. Not sure what it is overseas, but yeah, ZFO Sports weighted vest was uh, I would call it out of the three weight vests I purchased. It's my number third favorite. The other two are better, but I do like it because it is pretty durable, and I've had one for over ten years. So, whereas the other ones were a little fancier, but they one rusted, um, felt a little more comfortable than the ZFO one, but now it's all rusty and it kind of looks looks ugly. Um, but it's still effective. So <sighs> they they had some metal clips on it that rusted. That's all. But yeah, check that out. Those three will guide you in the right direction. I think. Once you get to the point where you don't feel like you have air left and you start chicken necking, <laughs> how do you mentally push that limit? Because you still have some air left. Uh, you know something? It's not safe to practice, to be honest with you, when you're underwater and by yourself. So don't ever do this by yourself. Don't swim by yourself. Don't swim underwater by yourself. People die every year doing it. So I'm starting with that general warning don't do this by yourself because you will you will pass out if you do it enough or too much um and that's deadly but if you start chicken necking one of my favorite techniques is actually try to swallow just do a little swallow of water you know water's going into your esophagus not into your lungs just do a swallow and you'll see it relaxes everything in the neck and you quit the chicken necking and making whale noises. Um, it's very effective in just letting you relax a few more mm. 10, 20 seconds without feeling like you have to rush up to the surface. So try swallowing. I have a theory behind it. I'm not sure if my theory is correct, but my theory is this, right? Whenever you inhale, or you swallow, there's a little device in your throat called the epiglottis, I think, which is one will cover the, the windpipe when you swallow, the other will cover the stomach or esophagus when you inhale, right? So whenever that thing moves, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily distinguish whether you inhaled or swallowed right or exhaled even um 
it, but it sends a signal to the brain and things relax in the throat after you do it. So that's my theory behind it. I could be completely wrong, but all I know is whenever I am trying to push that last 10, 20 yards of a 50 meter swim, I'll definitely swallow and that spit or swallow even pool water just a little bit, just enough to get a swallow in. That's what it'll feel like and it, it relaxes things. So try that. Let me know how it works for you. Just don't do it by yourself. And it doesn't work if you do it too early, right? So you got to do it, you know, later, like 40 seconds into it, maybe 30 seconds into it. And a little bit of exhale too, because it's not so much the lack of oxygen that's giving you the chicken necking. It's the buildup of CO2. So exhale a little bit of that CO2, do a swallow. Next thing you know, you're kind of relaxed again. And you got another, you know, plenty of time to finish a 50 meter if you have to, or stay underwater for, you know, fixing a scuba problem. And their intermediate cows and cardio is kicking my butt. Good job. If I can't make it to the top of the pyramid or straight through some of the circuits, can I take extra rest. Absolutely. Do what you can. You know, these pyramids aren't personalized programs, right? A pyramid is more of an assessment tool for you to see how high you can get up. Let's say you only get up to eight and then you try nine and you fail at four, right? So you got five more reps to get nine. You can take a little breather, shake it off, change grips, try nine pull-ups, or five more pull-ups. You know, if you had to break it up into two sets, that fine. But usually what I do is on that one, I fail. So I failed to get nine. I'm now coming back down in reverse order. So I'll go eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Um, or you can do a double ladder too. This is another way if you're not really used to doing pyramids, because the hardest part of a pyramid is that middle section from, five to 10 back down to five or maybe seven to 10 back down to seven for some. But if you want to get the same amount of volume with a little bit of mid point rest, try a double ladder. So you go one to nine and then you start back over where you fail, right? You failed at nine. You go ahead and double set that to get nine, and go back to one and build yourself up again and see if you can get back up to nine. Um, if you do that, you got yourself 90 pull-ups. So that's pretty good. That's a good high volume workout. So that's how I would do it. So play around with that a little bit. Next thing you know, you're you're crushing pyramids one to ten back down to one. Easily one of my favorite workouts. The other night I got a sudden pain in my lower back, but area can't bend well and a pain i walk bend i think it might be a muscle pull or spasm any tips Ugh. yeah i don't know man um i mean it could be that it could be a cramp you know hydrate could be you know maybe foam roll it a little bit see how that feels put a massage tool on it See how that loosens it up. And if that helps, that gets some heat to it, and then you can stretch it. That would probably be a winning combination, I would think. <clears throat> so what's the best way I can prevent friction burns chafing on my buns from sit-ups in the sand at Buds? Tape, body glide, anything. You know what? I didn't do anything. I just got them. And eventually you'll quit getting them. Um, yeah, they turn into more of a callus, but you'll get them at first. And we called them, um, you know, strawberries or, in fact, one of the best names I heard for them were called grinder reminders. Because as soon as you do some sit-ups on pavement and your butt's rubbing it and your back, you got a backbone back there that's hitting the pavement. You know, you're bleeding somewhere along that section between your shoulder blades and your 
and your butt bone. Um, and then you go jump in the water and then you feel it. And so they call that the grinder reminder that uh, you're like, oh, yeah, I have something back there going on. And then at the end of the day, you need to put some alcohol on it. It's going to burn, but it's going to dry it and make it tougher. And um, and then at night, um, you know, put some neosporin on it just so it doesn't get infected and then coat a big thing of neosporin on it maybe some kind of bandage um as well it's probably going to fall off during any wet and sandy event or another sit-up event but you know at least you have some protection on it for a little while so i i would definitely do that do you usually different pull-up grips to avoid overuse injury. Yes, I probably use um, three or four different grips. In fact, I just bought something. I can't see where they are. Let me see where they are here. Oh, there they are. Hang on one second. Here what I got. All right, so... I got these, um, so I use regular grip, reverse grip, kind of bring it in close. I don't like going wide because that tends to get a little elbow tendonitis there. So keep your reverse grips kind of close to you. You can go wider this way if you want. Um, you can do a prone grip or facing each other, a commando grip. You can go to shoulder to shoulder. Um, I just got these. These things are so cool. So you hook these on the pull-up bar, and now you got a prone grip where you can come in side by side on a pull-up bar. I also use them for uh, barbell bent over rows, right? So you can hook those things in there and, and grab it, grab just a different grip on there. These things are really cool. I don't know what they're called, but I just, um, I saw them online the other day and I said, that's what I need just to add some variety i think they're called prone grip um prone grip device barbell i'm not i can't remember the name of these things and see if something pops up i'll figure it out i got the receipt somewhere around here um but yeah these things are handy Hmm. Damn, I'm not seeing any of it. Bummer. But anyway, yeah. Try that out. Oh, wait a second. Kensu. K-E-N-S-U. I? No. K-E-N-S-U. Kensu grip. Let me see. K-E-N-S-U grip. Kensu grip. There they are. That's what it is. You can find them on on Amazon. It's Ken Sui grip has an eye on it, so that's where I screwed it up. So I'm gonna put this in here and use that. You can get these Ken Su grips. Now notice it's a really small bar. So if you got a real thick bar, it works great for a barbell, but anything bigger than a barbell for a pull-up bar, these don't fit. You can see it's kind of tiny there. So I have two bars that I can use these on, but I have a third bar that they don't fit on. So I don't use them for that one. So uh, let's see here. Where's where's my next picture or next question? All right. So any advice for drying your boots and buds after they get soaked? in the ocean water thoughts of using a hair dryer on the inside yeah that takes too much time if you go to google and actually search boot dryer there's an actual machine you can go to amazon and do it in fact they're basically these two little pipes that stick up like this and you put your boots on them in fact this is so good i'm just gonna oh shit. i said i couldn't ll beans not there let's see what this one is 
I don't see a picture. Dick Sporting Goods, Amazon, MM, LL Bean. All right, so check these out. This is worth me sharing my screen for. Um, boot dryer. Check this out. So let me know if you can see this. All right, so this boot dryer right here. You guys see that? And you look, that's 20 bucks. That is a good deal. So you plug this thing, it shoots air up into your boots, and you got yourself dry boots in about an hour. And you don't have to sit there with a, what you call it. Yeah. And what are they called? Simply dry, simple dry boot dryer. So yeah. You Google boot dryer, you'll be good to go. I wish I'd have thought of that one. But I had old boots that were just, they, they dried in like an hour anyway because they were old jungle boots. And there was literally no cloth in there. It was all hard canvas, leather, and uh, hard rubber for the uh, sole. Let's see. Good questions. <clears throat> I used to have a pain in my left palm of my hand. It hurts doing dips, push-ups, and are unbearable. What should I do? Left palm of your hand. Huh. That's a good question. I mean, does it hurt in the middle? Or does it hurt more in the heel palm of your hand? I mean, chances are you're just going to have to lay off those activities for a little bit. There may be a way if you can get some push-up handles, you know, push-up handles, and instead of being on your palm, you can kind of be on the heel of your palm. If that doesn't hurt, instead of being here, you can get here on the, uh, like a hex, hex bar dumbbell, or, you know, or maybe your fist, try a fist push-up. Not sure what you're going to do for dips, but dips may work too if you, use this heel palm versus the actual palm. You can try that. Can you get med drop from buds for hypothermia and not quitting involved? Um, depends. Usually what will happen is this. If you get hypothermic, they will do everything in their ability to warm you up. That means you probably have 30 minutes to an hour to get your body temperature back up. And that's they're They're getting it up there, but guess what they're going to do immediately. Once your body temperature is back to normal, they're going to get you wet again. And that's when people quit. But if you can endure that again, without quitting, you know, long, as long as you're not, hypothermic to a point where it's deadly you can keep going but if you're at a point where it's deadly they'll pull you for sure like you can't get let your temp body temperature get you know probably below 95 that's that's getting a little eh, i've seen 92 91 but they were pretty beat up so i don't i'm not sure what the limit is but there will be a limit what they define as safe for training. But as long as they can warm you up with running or uh, blankets and, you know, all the stuff they use for uh, getting you warm, you're solid. But if you're not, you're getting pulled. How long a rest do you take in between sets of pyramid workouts? Um, I try not to. Uh, to be honest with you, we have kind of evolved over the years to where we'll do pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, or if it's a Murph day type of thing, we'll do pull-ups, push-ups, squats, dips. Um, and our rest is a quarter mile run. So we'll actually rest our arms, legs, whatever, abs, and we'll go for a quick little quarter mile run for a couple of minutes, come back, and you hit set two. So I would say if you need to rest, rest. But if you don't need to, don't rest. 
and just keep moving. Because the way it's set up is you're usually resting with another upper body exercise that works a different muscle group. So you'll go pulling with pull-ups. You'll go pushing exercises with push-ups. You'll rest with abs, sit-ups or flutter kicks or whatever. And then sometimes I'll put dips in there, which is a second push, which makes your next set of push-ups harder. But, and then you go for a run after that. Or if you're trying to do a speed pyramid, which are really tough, is no rest, all exercises, and see if you can do a pull-up, push-up, sit-up, dip pyramid as fast as you can. No run, no rest, and just crank it out. Next thing you know, you, you've gotten to five, you know, six of everything, you know, sixth step, and it's barely even five minutes. But then you add a lot of time in with the other seven, eight, nine, ten, back down to one. I've seen guys do that thing in like 20, 21 minutes before. Some some guys have broken 20. But, yeah, it's really designed for muscle stamina. And if you need to rest, rest. But if you don't, try not to. The ultimate goal is to be able to do a one ten one pyramid with no rest. It's kind of like doing the 50-50. You know, you, know, you do 50-meter free, hard, 50-meter CSS hard, or steady, try to catch your breath during the 50-meter CSS. And then you got, um, then you got it from there. Uh, do you use any criteria on when you implement the various grips during your, your workout? For example, pyramid or max rep set? Hmm. Hmm. What the heck is on my foot? Hmm. Um, my criteria is uh, usually odd or evens. So sometimes I'll go odd, even, regular grip, you know, odd, regular grip, even grip, reverse, or even sets, reverse grip. Um, that's a great way to 50-50 your pyramids or whatever set you're doing. Um, you know, sometimes you can do three different grips and do one, two, three, three different grips, four, five, six, three different grips. So it doesn't really matter. Sometimes I'll go all the way up. And then I'll come down with a different grip or make a couple of changes on the way down. So, so this is the push up position. Yeah, that heel palm, probably not going to help you. My, my advice is probably do fist stuff and lay off dips because it's, it's not really good for your wrist if you, if you put the bar, you know, here in your, in your wrist and you know, your wrist bends 90 degrees while you're doing a dip or push up or bench press for that matter because i always like to try to keep it a little closer to the heel of the palm versus back here where your wrist is now 90 degrees when you're making that movement so my advice would be just do fist push-ups for a little while should be squeezing your shoulder blades together. Should you be squeezing your shoulder blades together and driving shoulders down when doing dips? Um, sounds right. Never looked at it that way, but yeah, I would say that's where I way I do dips. Yeah. What situation with asthma at buds? Inhaler use allowances? No, none, zero. In fact, we had a guy, a really good guy at the academy, got a seal billet, made it through all the screening and SOAS and everything, and he was going to buds. And then in the commissioning physicals that they have to do their senior year, he found out that he has asthma. He had no idea he had asthma, never took asthma medication, and uh, he just was a, a loud breathing runner, I thought. And next thing you know, he had 30% use of his lungs. And he made it through all of that PSTs and SOAS and screeners to go to Hell Week or go to, to Bud's and uh, on 30% of his lung capacity. 
So he cannot go to Bud's. So he is going a different job in the Navy. Kind of sucks. But he's making the best of it. And I think he's going Intel. He speaks Chinese. So he's just, he's going to be an asset in another way. Um, I shipped to Navy boot camp on the 15th. Good luck. I know people say you really get out of shape in those 10 weeks. Is there any way I can at least work out without being an 800 division? You got to squeeze it in whenever you can. My advice is make one day an upper body day. And every minute you can find a moment of time to do push-ups or sit-ups or find a pull-up bar, do them. Just accumulate reps on an upper body day. And on the next day, you do the same thing with legs. Accumulate squats and lunges. And at the end of the day, hopefully you've accumulated significant repetitions. You know, you can do these throughout the day. You can start off a little early in the morning before you, before you wake, everybody else wakes up. Um, you can get laundry duty and hang on the pull-up bars out there. You know, when you're sitting in a classroom, you can stand in the back of the room, do squats, do some wall sits, uh, just to stay awake. And, you know, some of the academic studies that you have to take, um, They'll tell you to stand up in the back if you're going to fall asleep anyway. So get back there and do some leg leg days or push-ups just to stay awake. Do what you can. It's a way to do it. Uh, do you think five or six slow miles a week is a good start after shin splints, stress fractures, or should I start back from run-walk combo? Thanks for your advices. Um, yeah, I think five to six is a fine place to start. Uh, maybe start it off like every other day, you know, running a mile and a half max a day, um, every other day with uh, walking, biking. You know, you're going to want to add some cardio to that because it's not going to take you long to run a mile a day. So you need to have at least, you know, 20 minutes of bike and another 30 minutes of swimming. Um, find another non-impact cardio you like and row or elliptical. Um, all of those things are going to be very helpful in you building some aerobic base without the impact of just running. So, yeah, give that a, a shot. You know, one to one and a half miles a day, you know, accumulating five by the end of the week. So every other day, perhaps might be a good way to get started and walk too. Uh, what are some key major differences in form breathing when ocean swimming versus pool swimming? Um, well, one's with fins, one without fins, but you could still swim with fins in the pool. So the really only differences is, is swimming straight. So every five or 10 strokes, I tend to look up, make sure I'm swimming straight. Um, but swimming with fins versus swimming without fins is different altogether. Uh, you're on your side the whole time. You're doing constant flutter kicks. You use your arms whenever you need to breathe. Otherwise, you're just in that glide position for maybe three or four kicks. Then you come up to breathe with a stroke, just like you do without fins. Yeah, that's it. Biggest thing is just swimming straight because people screw up swimming straight when they're in the ocean on day one week three your pst workout book and i see it says two miles on the bottom and swimming above that is that the way we need to do the workout or can we do them in different order you do them in any order you want just get them done in that day i don't care you know everybody's situation is different you know if you have to swim first before everything because that's when your pool's open do it. Swim first thing in the morning, then go do everything else. You know, if you need to rearrange the swim because the pool is closed in the afternoon, you know, add more running, right? So it's up to you how you do that. Remember, this is not a personalized program. So when you read it, it's not written for you. You need to make it 
fit in your day in your schedule as you need to and that may require some juggling but the goal at the end of the day is try to get everything done in that day um Let's see. Hey, Stu, were people going Marine Option at the Naval Academy looked at differently? No, not at all. Were they held to the same standard or higher standards? Well, you have two standards there. Um, everybody as a student has to take the Naval Academy fitness test, which is cadence push-ups, plank, and a mile and a half run. So guys that were going Marine Corps had to do that test too. Um, now they also had to take the three mile run, the pull-ups, the plank, they had to do the CFT, um, in order to qualify to go Marine Corps. So they were doing extra tests as well, just like the SEALs and the EOD guys are doing the PST on top of their normal Navy PFA or PF PRT. Um, you know, you just got to do extra. So nobody's really looked at differently. Um, I will say this, you know, if you're wanting to go SEAL or you're wanting to go Marine Corps and you're taking the regular PF PRT that everybody else is taking, you're expected to crush that thing. And if you're not, people are going to look at you like, you sure you want to go Marines? You sure you want to go SEAL? Because this PRT just kicked your butt. So, yeah, that's the only difference. There are definitely higher standards for Marine, SEAL, EOD, just as there's higher academic standards for people that want to go nuke. So really does depend on what your job is and what you're preparing to, to go do. Uh, Morning, Stu. Any tips on getting more streamlined during the CSS? My kick is strong. Um but I feel myself swimming more uphill than straightforward in the water. Uh, I need to see it to fix it. I can't just sit here like that. But I did write an article called Streamline, the most important skill for swimming speed. And you can start here by looking at this article that I just put in the comment section. That's a good place to start. Is it possible for a uh, become a Heroes of Tomorrow instructor, coach as a civilian who follows your programming? Yes. In fact, I have several who do that. What is required and determine fellow coaches? Um, I like to, you know, make sure people are certified in their training. Um, you know, they have their own insurance as well. That's just why people get certified so they can get insurance, um, and then. You know, it's up to you how often you want to do it. What I recommend people to do is just like what I do, for instance, six days a week, I work out with people who want to train to do something in military, law enforcement, or firefighters, spec ops mostly. Um, and um, what I will do with them is they're just my workouts that I invite people to do. So even if nobody showed up, which I think has happened once in 20 years, um, even if nobody showed up, I would still just be working out on my own. So I don't lose any time in that area. So where people, I think a lot of people screw up as they start making appointments. And that's a bad way to do it. Just you're working out at six in the morning or six in the evening, have people join you. Right. And then what I do is I send, uh, I send you what we're doing to give you ideas as well. But yeah, you can email me, Stu at StuSmith.com. We can talk about it. Would you say that having fins and doing the 50-50 is a good idea? Sure. We did 50-50 fins today. In fact, I'm having a guy work on his scissor kick. So what I did was um, we added a kickboard to that. So he did 25 meters with a kickboard. And then he did a 50 50. Um, he did half of it with fins and half of it without fins. So, but he was always adding a 25 kickboard just to work on that CSS scissor kick. So, yeah, you can play around with it all you want. 
Let's see. What are we looking at? Hmm. I guess that's about it. So tomorrow I'm going to be doing uh, the combat swimmer stroke video. And um, if you have any uh, videos you want me to critique, send them in. You can send them to Stu at StuSmith.com or you can send them to uh, uh, in my Instagram DMs. That's a good place to send them. I just, I just need 50 meters of you swimming. So down and back. It's plenty, and I should be able to tell you what you're doing right and wrong in that period of time. Um, all right, so it's been 50 minutes. I actually have a, that article I'm about to finish. Need to get that done and then get back to work. Got some stuff going on today. So with that, I will chat with you guys later. Thanks for sticking around. If I missed your question, I apologize. You can always email me, stu at stusmith.com. You guys check out Stu Smith Fitness. Also, if you use uh, Live15 in the coupon code over at stusmithfitness.com, save 15% on books and ebooks. And um, and if you remind me, if you buy something, you remind me, I'll send you that ebook for free about um, all the 10 mistakes that you can make with your Spec Ops dreams. So it's a good one that I'm just giving away for free or you can buy it by yourself. So, all right, folks, you guys have a good one. I will see you guys tomorrow. Until then, see you.